my great pleasure uh, to uh, welcome uh, Professor Igor Yurishitsa. Um, he's a professor at the University of Toronto um, at several uh, departments. Also, he's a senior scientist at Cremble Research Institute, also. Studies. Uh, he has many affiliations. Uh, he's also an adjunct uh, professor at the School of Computing, Pathology, and Molecular Medicine at Queen's University in Canada, also of Computer Science uh, Department at York University in Toronto. Um, also, he's an adjunct scientist um, with the Slovak Academy, Slovak uh, National. Uh, Academy of Sciences, uh, and also an honorary professor in China at uh, Shanghai uh, Jiao Tong University. Uh, since 2015, Igor has also served as uh, the chief scientist at the Creative Destruction Lab at Rockman School of Management, also at the University of Toronto. He published extensively on data mining, visualization, cancer informatics, including many papers in science, nature, feature medicine, nature methods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. His over 29,000 citations, H index of 79, according to uh, Google Scholar, uh, including over 840 uh, highly influential citations, according to Semantic Scholar, and uh, nearly 14,000 lifetime citations, according to the Web of Science. He won numerous awards, including a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Integrative Cancer Informatics, the IBM Faculty uh, Partnership Award, he won that three times, and also he's a fourth time uh, recipient of IBM Shared University Research Award. Uh, he's been included in Tom, uh, Thomson Reuters in 2016, 15, 14 list of highly cited researchers. Also the most influential uh, scientific minds of 2014 and 15 uh, reports. Uh, in addition, in 2019, he was included in the top 100 AI leaders in drug discovery and advanced uh, health care uh, healthcare list. Uh, Igor's research focuses on integrative informatics and uh, the representation, analysis, and visualization of high dimensional data to identify prognostic predictive signatures to determine uh, clinically relevant combination therapies and develop accurate models of drug mechanisms of action and disease altered signaling capacity. It was my honor and pleasure to have Igor as my PhD supervisor when I was a PhD student at the University of Toronto. Um, and uh, it is my great pleasure uh, 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 to, to welcome him now to present uh, his work to us. Igor, it's yours. Uh, thank you very much, Natasha, and thank you for the invitation. And as we discussed at the beginning, I mean, definitely would be nice to meet in person, but hopefully even through this limited media, um, we can enjoy it. And definitely uh, thank you for the invitation. Hopefully my slides do show. Yes. Yes, yes, they look good. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so what I will try to go through, and maybe I will skip through some parts, depending on how the time goes, um, is uh, some of the examples. Over the years, I've worked mostly on cancer. We are interested in various kind of networks and also uh, how we can move into precision medicine and identifying markers uh, for individual patients and then more precision treatment for those patients. And over the years, we started to work also with arthritis and neurodegenerative diseases. So it's kind of uh, nicely expanding into various areas, but I will try to highlight the aspects of methods, especially of these networks of uh, how we can take advantage of this information computationally and uh, guide basically biological and clinical translational studies. So one of the things that nobody can escape is that uh, over the last uh, decade or so, it seems like AI, artificial intelligence or machine learning has been reinvented yet again. Uh, but even more importantly, it seems that uh, public and uh, journalists think that AI and some of the scientists, that AI will completely replace everything that human does. Um, while there are obviously a lot of great success stories and progress, uh, one has to be caution because question is, what are we trying to optimize? Why? And is there a need for it? Or are we basically harming ourselves by using AI blindly? And I will try to highlight a few aspects of this. And also in the context of what are we trying to do in integrative informatics is to integrate different kind of data, but have networks to help us understand 
Does it make sense or is it potentially noise? And obviously, the more data we have, the more heterogeneity we have to deal with. There are multiple technical, but also ethical and legal issues, which I will not touch. But it's especially on the technical side, we have the heterogeneity of samples, biological assays, types of analysis that give us different biomarkers, different predictions, subgroups of cohorts of patients, different predictions for drug treatments, different predictions for interacting partners, for transcription factor regulatory networks, and so on. There are multiple biases in terms of the cohorts of patients or samples that are collected and how are they collected, confounding factors uh, from the methodologies, as I mentioned earlier. But importantly, as it was shown, actually it's now almost 10 years ago, that uh, frequently evidence-based medicine is using literature as uh, the guidance of how to treat patients, how to conduct future experiments. Unfortunately, a large fraction of these papers actually are fraud or mistakes or suspected fraud, as was published in PNAS almost 10 years ago. And I will have some additional notes on this on the next slide. But one of the aspects now with the AI machine learning is that we are using all of this data, all of these papers and all of this data from the literature. And one frequently forgets about all of those issues of heterogeneity, biases, and so on. But also imagine that these papers eventually get retracted and AI and machine learning algorithms already produce results that will not get retracted because they trained or validated uh, the prediction power on those data sets that potentially are incorrect or they have some flaws. So one has to be careful of it, in addition to obviously the fact that if we train the system on a cohort from South America, it might not work on a cohort from North America or Europe or Asia. And so it, we cannot use these samples blindly of uh, here is a disease, here is the validation. We have to keep track of details of those patient samples and how they are used. And for that reason, it's important to not have a blind system or black box. We have to have explanation and modeling, which these networks, I hope, will convince you are very useful for. And so AI really has to include not just the algorithm, being it neural network or decision trees or random forest. The data is critical. Where is the data coming from? How independent the data is, how well annotated the data is, and so on. But also, where are we applying it for? And what is really the overall system where it plugs in, as I will show in the next example, and how is it really used? So going back to the data quality, uh, we looked at uh, PubMed and uh, all of the articles, and how many of the articles are retracted on a yearly basis. And as you can see, until about 2000, it was relatively steady. And after, we have exponentially increasing or strongly increasing uh, number of retracted papers per year. And this is obviously taking into account that each year we have more papers published. So the denominator is taken into consideration. Now, there are many possible explanations for this, and I don't want to speculate that can be lecture on its own of what are the causes or reasons for this kind of uh, strong increase. But definitely AI and machine learning and computational analysis is one of those because uh, we can find those errors faster or easier. So it does help, but it also creates a problem, as I mentioned earlier, with the training and validation. So this, these aspects of uh, not, not uh, focusing blindly just on technology, but considering what data the technology is using and how are we using it, very good example is uh, from IBM Watson. Uh, many years back, they started trying to apply to healthcare and especially into cancer treatment. And initially, the idea was that it will replace humans uh, in treat oncologists in uh, treating cancers. Now, MD Anderson, one of the largest uh, cancer centers, after a few years working with it, basically uh, removed it from the practice uh, and declared that it's not working. But it's a little bit too harsh to say that. And the reason would be to look into why did it fail and can something be done around it? And so the next example really shows what I think is the reason. So one aspect is that IBM Watson uh, takes text and analysis of uh, large volumes of information into consideration and has a very good power for it. Unfortunately, it's not using too much data, just mostly literature or what is published. And as you can see, 
their own example, uh, looking at what is the relationship between two genes, AK21 and BTK, they found only 162 documents identifying genes that potentially explain the relationship between them. The edges represent some kind of evidence for their relationship and the strength of the, the evidence. But you can immediately see that it's relatively sparse. First of all, not too many information about the relationship between them. And second of all, uh, we don't need to see blue G in the middle uh, because we know that these are the genes based on a name and it might be useful to see some other information. So kind of enhancing it would help. And one way to enhance it is to take other data predictions and also annotations. So the exactly the same question at the same time using uh, protein interaction data with annotation from disease networks, this GeneNet, and also from uh, drug bank and other drug related information. You can quickly identify that we have uh, over uh, almost 900 protein interactions for BTK and almost 1400 for AKT1. But on top of it, we can annotate them to either muscle skeletal disease, neurodegenerative as blue or both, and identify drug targets for both uh, with the larger letters and gene ontology, in this case, molecular function. But the same, exactly the same question, one can really take this into context of disease. You can obviously push it further with newer information and identify disease-specific subnetworks for arthritis or neurodegenerative or cognitive disorders or combination of both. But if you really move it forward, you can start integrating other pieces of information. So this was only on protein interactions and genes. Uh, there was an earlier paper on identifying microRNAs that are protective or disruptive for the joints. And so you can take those microRNAs and using other tools predict their gene targets and identify if those gene targets overlap with the prediction from the protein interaction networks. Those are highlighted with, uh, again, stronger letters and the uh, protective are green, disruptive are red. So you can, again, go much further of predicting what is really the involvement uh, of these genes within the disease and in relationship to BTK and AKT1 in this case. Most of the studies would need to be validated. And so again, one can use the strong annotation of these different interaction networks and identify which model organism would have this network conserved most. And what is interesting is that while in arthritis, for example, it's uh, either rodents, so rat or mouse, but frequently pig or dog are used as model organisms. Uh, what is interesting is actually the dog is the worst of the, those, pig is not, and mouse is the best or most conserved network that one can use for validation, which is a good news because if you can validate it, that means that it would be the cheapest experiments that you can run. But this kind of analysis can also tell you that maybe it is the pig model that you have to use if you want to validate specific signaling within these networks. One has to be also obviously careful because all of this annotation is just um, it is, is a moving target. Uh, we have some of it, but we know we don't have all of it. And so if you look into, for example, uh, tissue, we can see that there is a large uh, annotation that goes across relatively well studied tissues, but for skeletal muscle, it's significantly fewer uh, overlaps from these networks. And if you look into the disease, that's even more worse because most of the studies are related to cancer. So everything else seems that it's not relevant, although arthritis is the second best uh, target. So that's, that's, that's one aspect, but when we are using machine learning approaches, we are trying to go through a large number of different data sets. And one has to be again careful that how these data sets were processed and what does it mean? This is one specific example we uh, worked with one of the researchers from Princess Margaret Cancer Center, Raz Hakem, on uh, RNF8 and uh, in relationship to breast cancer. He had a lot of studies related to uh, mouse experiments and was interested if we can help to validate it on a human samples. Breast cancer human samples, there is a really large, large uh, uh, number of data sets that one can use with many samples. And if you take RNF8, it has two probes, many um, Affymetrix arrays available, 2,000 patients, and you can find that the difference is significant, but clinically completely useless. Uh, there is no real difference between the two curves. However, when one look into it more carefully, there are two probes. If you take one probe, you get a little bit better separation of the curves, uh, 
but you can see that high expression is beneficial. Well, if you take the other probe for RNF8, you realize that it's just complete opposite, which obviously explains why uh, if you combine them, uh, you find that there is not really any difference. Now, the challenge is that there are many studies that uh, combine multiple probes for a given gene and represent it as a single number. This basically shows you that's really, really bad idea. Now, the question is, which one would you use? One or the other or combination? Well, luckily, we can go back to the sequence of those probes and identify that it's one of those probes, which is uh, which is uh, uh, conserved between human and mouse, and is also the full length uh, version of that protein, uh, is the right one. So we don't need to guess. We can use the sequence to identify what is the right probe. But again, highlighting the fact that if you do high throughput validation across many different studies, one has to potentially go into such detail as identifying what is the sequence of those probes and what those probes do represent. The other aspect I wanted to highlight is really the, the validation of artificial intelligence or kind of specifying what is our goal. And while this study was also on breast cancer uh, about a year ago published, was a nice attempt to identify and validate across two different cohorts on two different continents how AI can potentially replace radiologists. If you pay attention to, I think it was a table two, uh, I think it warrants further discussion. And one aspect is that overall, they determined that AI can re uh, replace humans. But if you look at it, it's actually that AI is not really inferior to humans in UK, but it's superior in US. And so it's not that AI is better than human experts. AI is better than system that is using uh, different approaches or different healthcare standards in UK versus US. And the difference is that in UK, you have to have two radiologists agreeing on the diagnosis before it's deemed uh, correct. In the US, it's only one reader. So AI can basically uh, improve an inferior uh, health system, but cannot really beat yet the superior health system. And so one can look at it that definitely there is a place for AI, but maybe as a second opinion at this point to help uh, triaging and help with uh, expertise, not really replacing the radiologist because we would lose the ability to innovate in radiology. And so we, we can uh, use it to assist. So the other aspects of this uh, integrated computational biology is that it's a workflow. And it really starts with uh, quality of samples that are collected or the way they are collected, high throughput platforms for their uh, analysis, being it uh, on a protein metabolome or, or uh, transcriptome level. Then different types of databases or portals that try to combine the information across many different studies and also then annotate it and integrate it with additional information such as transcriptional regulatory networks, micro to gene networks, drugs, uh, ontologies, protein interaction networks, pathways, diseases, and so on, which then through the analysis, we can create models that can explain certain behavior, certain changes, and create really explainable models of this is happening, this is what we are seeing, but how potentially it is happening and what could it potentially mean. And I will have some of those examples later on. But overall, the goal is that we can then identify some biomarkers that can group patients into more similar subgroups, four or more, and then identify potential uh, therapeutic approaches that can be beneficial uh, to the course of the disease. So one of the interesting things that is coming is that this integration of different types of data is not just on a level of uh, a kind of the depth of the annotation can go further. In the earlier examples, I was showing more uh, annotation at the higher level or integration with the networks. This was one of the examples where we were able to integrate not only protein interaction network, but also expression across different tissues. And what is interesting is that the same network potentially uh, through co-expression analysis was identifying that was very different across different tissues. And what was interesting is that we not only identify that uh, normal suppressor in epithelial tumors was actually oncogene in lung adenocarcinoma uh, through these kind of predictions. And we were able to validate it on external samples, both biologically and computationally. 
And so this really kind of extends the complexity. Earlier, uh, we were discussing with Natasha, uh, what is the size of the, for example, human protein interaction network? And the answer is that, first of all, it's much bigger than we thought. The second is that obviously, it will be even more complex when we start considering the disease and also tissue context, because these networks will basically just multiply across all of those different contexts. When some, some such example, for example, was that we were initially working with uh, clinicians on kidney fibrosis. And fibrosis obviously affects other organs. But in this case, uh, in kidney samples, they identified through mass spectrometry uh, several proteins that were strongly predicting uh, a problem with, uh, for uh, kidney transplant patients. We were able to identify and validate those uh, and basically have a predictive model. But we were interested to see how potentially they can work or what, what's the mechanism of action for why are those specific proteins potentially interesting for predicting uh, fibrosis. But on top of it, other collaboration in uh, lung, where also there is a lung fibrosis problem uh, with patient, basically led us to take this network of uh, those specific markers that were predictive in kidney fibrosis and see if we can translate them into lung. And again, it's relatively easy because we can take those, we can annotate those interactions as uh, kidney specific, lung specific, or both. And as you look at the network, most of the edges that are in between those markers are actually green. So they are both kidney and lung. Those more kidney or lung specific interactions are those that are unique to those specific markers, but are not as much shared across different markers. So based on the prediction, we were able to actually validate that the same markers are have a value in, uh, in uh, predicting fibrosis in uh, lung patients. You can also use this additional uh, information and combine it with other markers that are in the literature. And the same as I was mentioning earlier, uh, you can use the annotation to start predicting, is it likely correct or are we potentially chasing some incorrect information? And so as you can see, the network conservation uh, in cancer goes really down and in urinary system cancer or thoracic cancer, it's really down versus in kidney and lung normal tissue the conservation is relatively high. Uh, so it again kind of amplifies the fact that it's not just the tissue, but it's also the disease context that one can take into consideration. And as I was mentioning earlier, um, we can then look into what is the best organism for the validation. And again, in, in uh, uh, kidney uh, transplant, it's again PIC that is usually used as a kind of closest to human model, but mouse has a relatively well conserved this specific network. And so the, 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 the question here is not, what is the closest organism uh, to, to human? But if we are looking at a specific protein interaction network, which organism has this network conserved most? And in this case, it's uh, again, mouse. But you can also see that obviously you cannot do many of those experiments or fly or other model organisms. So the importance uh, that I tried to highlight was that we need high quality data. And uh, many years ago, we started in uh, ovarian cancer. And since then, we expanded to other diseases to build what we call data integration portals. And um, it's basically going through uh, data sets in uh, either GEO, Area Express, or through literature and identifying those that uh, are potentially useful for the analysis, but also then ensuring that the methods, uh, form of data available and, and annotation is uh, available. So in, for example, osteoarthritis, we have now over 11,000 patients in lung cancer, about 6,000 patients. And we can identify frequently up and down regulated genes, and I will have some examples of that analysis. But what is important that clinical information is uh, always there. So one can also drill through those an annotations and uh, identify subsets of the data specific uh, to a certain question that one may have, but also to ensure that we don't have information missing. Like for example, in lung cancer, if we don't have smoking status or we don't have uh, EGFR mutation status, it's going to limit where we can use the data. And if we don't have a raw data, that means that we cannot really verify if the uh, if the pre-processing was done correctly or, or uh, to an equal standard as their other data. 
So one such example I will show is on osteoarthritis, which is the most recent addition to, to our, our uh, set of portals. And it's relatively small, but still uh, this kind of uh, um, inverted pyramid is frequent. You can identify a large number of papers that relate to the disease, but by the end, uh, there are relatively very few papers or data sets that are relevant. And there are many di different reasons why we have to exclude the data sets. They are not available, they are already pre-processed and, and uh, not well described, or they are not on human samples. They may not relate to the disease. They are partial, not full, and so on and so forth. Uh, obviously, we keep track of all of the different information. So it's not only high throughput, say low throughput, but also what type of a joint and then what type of a sample for the given joint. So again, that de then uh, determines of what kind of questions you can answer with this information. But if you take it holistically, uh, we looked, for example, over the years when we were building it, of how is the information changing. So this is showing uh, the rank of the upregulated genes across a large number of studies. And it shows the, the, the color shows how strongly they are and how it's changing over the releases of the of the database of data integration portal and same for downregulated genes. So it really shows that top 20 are not changing drastically, which means that we are saturating what we can learn from available data at least. Doesn't mean that we know it all, but at least as we are adding new data sets, we are not finding uh, completely different sets of genes. We can then obviously run pathway enrichment analysis on the up and down regulated genes. And at the really high level, what is kind of a, a good sanity check is that if you look into the up regulated genes, the pathways that are involved are relating to adhesion, collagen, integrin, kind of makes sense. And when you look at the Downregulated genes is mostly related to fatty acids and metabolism, uh, biosynthesis and signaling. So it's interesting finding, uh, especially that obviously obesity is related factor for uh, um, arthritis, osteoarthritis. And one can then argue, uh, is it the underlying biology uh, with the metabolism that is incorrect, or is it really the, just the overweight uh, of the patient that is creating the problem? And it's probably for different patients, different combination of these two. Then when we look into the networks, we can identify protein interactions that are relevant to these targets and then identify them across different uh, uh, cell types that are relevant for the osteoarthritis. And again, very important because overall, it's uh, all, over uh, 650,000 interactions that could be relevant potentially for the osteoarthritis. But if you look into the synovial membrane, it's only about 200,000 interactions. But one of the things that we wanted to do was to try to see if this kind of holistic uh, data-driven approach what kind of treatment can we predict? And so we took the up and down regulated genes and used uh, transcriptome profiles of drugs to identify drugs that would be inverting those up and down regulated genes. On the list of, <coughs> excuse me, on the list of uh, top 10 drugs that we identified, what was interesting is that five already had preclinical or animal model validations. And so, Basically, just data-driven approach, you can say blind, uh, we are identifying the same thing as people identified over, uh, say, 20 years of research, molecular research uh, into predicting drugs. But what is more important, we also identify two drugs that potentially could be novel approach uh, for treating uh, osteoarthritis. And importantly, it's not just, again, black box. We have the mechanism of action of these drugs, how they are working through which pathways, and what are the underlying network connections through which they work, which means that we don't need to apply the drug and wait for a year to see the outcome. We can start measuring those specific markers and see if they are responding in a direction we would predict from this model. <clears throat> The integration can go further. I already uh, mentioned this, this article that identify uh, protective and uh, disruptive microRNAs real, from the literature. So it was a curated effort uh, for osteoarthritis. We can combine it with the information that we had on up and down regulated genes from this portal. So completely orthogonal approaches. But when you combine it, you can identify uh, protective, disruptive microRNAs and identify which genes are regulated in which way, down-regulated or up-regulating or 
deregulated in general, like MMP9. And so again, strongly identifying potential links from completely uh, different studies, but linking them through the networks for better explanation. So going into ovarian cancer example, this was an interesting study because uh, most of the patients with ovarian cancer, especially high grade serous ovarian cancer, have p53 mutation. And so for a long time, there was a question if different types of p53 mutation relate to the outcome. Epidemiology did not really find any information, so we took uh, basic immunohistochemistry and patient information and used the cell organizing maps to cluster the patients into potentially different groups. And then we identified four main clusters of patients. And what was interesting is that three clusters did not really have a different survival, but one cluster had a much worse survival than the rest. So now while if you take all of the patients and look at the P53 mutation, you don't find anything statistically meaningful. If you take these four different clusters identified through machine learning, you can identify that while there is not black and white difference, the larger the letters, the more frequent is the mutation, specific mutation, P53 mutation in that group of patients. So now knowing the kind of more prevalent mutations in a given uh, patient subgroup, obviously we are interested in what is the mutation that is in uh, cluster three. And what is interesting is that if you create a network of P53 and its interacting partners, there is obviously a huge number of partners that are not really annotated at the moment or relevant, but we have the annotations at least into the evidence for uh, relevance in ovaries from RNA-seq or from uh, protein information, so green or blue, or no evidence. So while BRCA1, BRCA2 are uh, very strongly related to ovarian cancer and breast cancer research, we don't have any specific information we can bring in, neither on mutation nor on the expression. But definitely what caught our attention was that BCL2 complex is strongly related and there is also a strong relation. You can see the specific mutations that modify these uh, interactions based on P53 mutation. And so we have disrupted mutations, uh, only two, and the increasing or reduced interaction as a, as a result of the mutation. Now, while it is interesting because this basically potentially explains why these patients have a worse survival because there is other work previously that identifies that patients with a BCL2 down regulation or inactivation uh, do develop resistance to the taxol treatment, which obviously would result to the worse survival. So this information then can get further annotated. And again, it's a work in progress. We don't have all of the edges with the mutation annotation. And many of the edges are only identified as mutation affected interaction. So we don't know if it's down or up regulated and obviously more uh, detailed studies uh, would need to go into this. But it's again, very, very nice that one can go from linking high throughput data through protein interactions, through mutations to potential response to the treatment and have predictive model with explanation. So going more on the ovarian cancer, we were interested in the high grade serous ovarian cancer, which is about 80% of all ovarian cancer. And it's the, especially the population of, uh, of uh, about 20% of those have one of the markers uh, strongly upregulated, and there is a strong difference in, uh, in uh, survival for those patients. So while it's only about 20% of the 80%, uh, it's still potentially interesting because we have specific marker that can identify that population. So we were interested to see if we can predict any potential uh, treatment and what can be done about it. So while the, the, the survival is significantly reduced, this is on mouse experiments, we can also see a very strong difference in terms of the tumor site, ascites value, is changing uh, across the, on the mouse experiments for, for those populations or up and down regulated this specific biomarker. But what is important is that then we predicted potential treatment and while treating the mice, we have a significant improvement of survival. So now that potentially is interesting. Those were validations in a mouse. And again, if we validate on a larger cohort from uh, TCGA, we can see that there is a strong relationship of that uh, overexpression of that marker uh, worse survival. 
We then validated it on uh, tissue microarrays on a relatively small sample, but at least uh, human samples from our hospital. And then we were interested to see if we can use the same approach I showed earlier, but I don't have time to go into detail to identify how it potentially works. And once we do, we can do actually in silico trial and see if we invert those genes that are involved as a response to the drug treatment, we can see that actually we change the survival of those patients. And so it still needs further validation, obviously on a human trial, but at least mouse experiments, uh, model through the networks, and in this, in this way, taking the network and predicting what would happen if you apply the drug is showing that it has a positive effect in the direction of treatment. So clinical relevance really is, especially for the high-grade serous ovarian cancer, as I mentioned earlier, and especially for stage one, when the difference is actually quite strong, even for a clinical application. Now, while it's really interesting, all of the uh, studies that I described so far are using existing drugs, existing transcriptional profiles or description from a drug bank or CTD to identify which drugs might apply to the specific cohort. Unfortunately, this graph basically shows us that uh, we are, that's a very limited view. And where we are is maybe 4% of the FDA approved drugs in terms of the targets for the human proteins. And we really need to go into the novel targets. And so this requires completely different approach. The other aspect is this graph, which shows that if you take all of the drugs and sort them based on um, how many genes they modify, you can see that small fraction of drugs modify most of the genes. And so there are many drugs that are only uh, identical, kind of targeting very few genes, but they are targeting genes that are targeted by most of the other drugs. And so what we would need is more specific drugs, which is taking kind of creating a connection from this end of the graph to this end of the graph. And that's very rare. So in order to go into the different discovery mode, uh, one of the application is um, from uh, Stefano Forley from Scripps Institute that about a year ago, obviously because of COVID, uh, started to use uh, Autodoc, which is a docking algorithm, optimized it also for uh, platform on a world community grid running Boeing and also optimizing it then for a GPUs to in less than 300 days uh, using about 100,000 volunteer computers he basically run 300 million uh, simulations and now they are validating compounds in the lab for potential treatment against COVID. Now this is quite interesting because you may view it as a brute force but it's a very interesting approach of uh, using the basically citizen science to expand significantly computational capabilities that we have and try to identify something very different that normally we would not have computing power to do in the lab. Now, that might be interesting, but as I was showing earlier, um, there are many different subgroups of patients that we, we need to identify. And while, for example, we can speed up uh, drug discovery and we can speed up identification of treatments, one cannot really skip through clinical trials and the validation. So the models can identify better ways of how to go through these experiments, but it cannot replace them. And we can now see it uh, through, for example, COVID treatments, as we are discovering which populations do benefit from um, mixed treatments from Pfizer to Moderna to Astra and so on and which subgroups definitely are at a higher risk and this is not working for them and so on. So one of the aspects is really to go and try to understand better the virus human interactome and try to then link it to what we know about individual patients and uh, how potentially the signaling really works. What is the mechanism of action of the treatment? And that's definitely uh, for many years to come to understand. Now, one of the aspects with kind of when I started on COVID, obviously very important topic over the last uh, year and a half, one has to be careful again uh, how we use the data. It was interesting earlier uh, this year, there was a, there was a study uh, that was highlighted on BBC that was suggesting that obviously obesity is fact, risk factor for, uh, for COVID infection and uh, response. But one has to be careful how 
identifies that information because they were trying to uh, kind of link it that UK has a high rate of, uh, of obesity, but that doesn't explain why the response of the patients in UK is worse. And one of the reasons is that at a time, Belgium has much lower uh, obesity, but actually they had a much worse rate of, uh, of death uh, per million. And on the other hand, Australia has a much higher, or much higher, has a higher uh, obesity rate, yet their death rate was lower. So there are obviously many different factors that influence it, and BMI is not the only thing, and one cannot go too far of trying to infer and explain why certain countries do better or worse. Especially uh, then when we start looking into this, uh, it's, a, it's important that we reduce the amount of politics in science and uh, we increase the science in politics. And obviously there are many factors that influence this kind of uh, curve. It's looking at the death per million versus uh, cases per million in the country. But obviously one has to take into consideration how many tests are done, because if you don't test, you don't have uh, numbers that can go further. And definitely that's probably the reason why China and India are on the bottom of this curve and we don't have a good grasp of, uh, of or, or gravity of uh, death versus cases per million. On the other hand, though, you can start identifying countries like Israel, for example, where and although this curve is a little bit earlier, but uh, or this data is from a little bit earlier, uh, but how the vaccination rates are affecting uh, the curve or slope of the curve, how the stringency of the response or limitations of what is open, what is closed and travel and so on is affecting this. And obviously over time, you can do this kind of curve and it will be changing on a weekly or monthly basis. But it really highlights the fact that in many countries, uh, the death per million is worse than what would be the expected based on a cases per million and vice versa. There are some countries where uh, the ratio is a little bit better. But one has to be, again, careful. It depends on obviously number of tests or type of tests. Uh, I know of many cases personally where people had absolutely no symptoms, yet because of travel, they were tested and they were deemed positive. And so if you are healthy and you don't know about it, uh, Obviously, you are not part of the, or you are not tested. You are not part of this uh, this data. So it's data with many unknowns, uh, and interpretation has to be careful. Earlier this year, many organizations, including the uh, Global Knowledge, uh, try to identify countries that are safe within Europe or internationally, and. It's kind of interesting, but when uh, you make a prediction, so this is from April last year, and then you can look now, where are those countries and how does it fare? And clearly it's not even close to many of these predictions because uh, for example, Hungary or, or Czech Republic uh, don't do actually that well. And many other countries that were deemed to be worse are much better. So again, it's a combination of multiple things. It's not just uh, what's the economic status of the country or what's the government, uh, how much military the country has. Uh, there are many other things that influence these curves. If you look, and this is more recent, actually from October 11 curves, uh, this is uh, confirmed cases per million. And uh, you can see that many countries have these uh, multiple ways where it just shoots for various reasons, uh, significantly higher, uh, death per million and uh, fatality rate. So when you start looking into it, uh, I was uh, pleased when I was obviously invited to give a talk here that Spain is actually leading now in terms of the receive at least one dose of vaccination. Canada is second, uh, at least from the countries I looked at. And here is Montenegro, which was shooting through the roof. Uh, and it's probably one of the reasons why uh, they are having such a bad outcome. Slovakia, in that sense, it's uh, almost the same. So the interesting comparison obviously are, uh, for example, Czech Republic, Slovakia. They used to be together. They are very close uh, in many aspects. And the response and also the, the outcome of COVID is quite different. Same is comparison, for example, Canada and US, uh, because again, uh, a lot of similarities or Portugal and Spain and so on. 
But what is really alarming to me is, uh, and some people really describe it that COVID is not the pandemic, but it's a test in intelligence, is uh, how countries fare in terms of who would not even take the vaccine. And again, not surprising, I'm glad to hear or see that uh, Spain is on a one of the best countries in terms of most of the people would be willing or want to get vaccinated. But there are many countries and surprisingly Germany, for example, UK, uh, that don't want uh, the vaccination. And for better or worse, uh, I think the data is showing that it's uh, more beneficial than harmful. So when you start considering this kind of analysis, uh, I describe some of the aspects of uh, these models that take networks and take uh, kind of deeper annotation into consideration. And with COVID, we already see it, and obviously that goes into other diseases like cancer or arthritis, that there are many other things we don't know yet. Uh, what is the lifestyle? What is the environment where we are? And so this is one of the studies from Mike Snyder's group that was uh, quite interesting where he was looking at the metabolomic profiles across seasons of individuals and kind of showing that even across seasons, there are very strong differences that you can identify that relate in this case to insulin uh, response. And so we need to expand the, the comprehensiveness or complexity of data that we will be integrating if we really want to go into what I would call patient-centric or individualized approach. And so combining it uh, where we are is trying to take as much information as we have from omics, uh, clinical information, but include uh, variable devices, lifestyle, environment, as much as possible uh, to integrate into some knowledge graph that can be analyzed uh, through using graph theory, but also uh, machine learning and other statistical approaches to identify subgroups of patients that have certain similar characteristics. And then we can go into the patient network and try to see that while we do have uh, each patient as a snowflake, there are similarities, but there are also big differences among them. Can we use that kind of evidence from one patient to another to improve the treatment, improve the prediction of the cause of disease? And this example is just highlighting very quickly uh, from osteoarthritis, lower back pain problem. And uh, the solid color, kind of uh, quickly describing, circles are patients for, which we are, for whom we are trying to predict uh, triangles are patients that we use as evidence-based medicine, uh, case-based reasoning. Uh, what is the status? And the color uh, shows either improving or not, uh, red. And the outline shows what is the prediction versus what is the true information. And so this shows that in many cases we are dead on, uh, red to red, green to green. But this is set of patients where we are completely wrong. And we are wrong in both ways. We predict that the patient will improve and they don't. We predict that the patient uh, will not improve and they do. But what I want to highlight is that if you look at it, it's, it's impossible even for human to predict otherwise because all of the patients are improving. So of course we are predicting that patients should improve, but it doesn't. And so question is why? Uh, maybe that relates to the lifestyle or that relates to some other aspects that we were not considering uh, and we cannot consider because uh, in a sense, even machine learning or doctor looking at it based on evidence-based uh, approach, the prediction is right. It's just the outcome is incorrect. And that's definitely one aspect to highlight that uh, missing information is going to uh, be creating a problem for a while. So to kind of finalize, um, I would like to highlight that regardless of what is the disease, arthritis, neurodegenerative or cancer, we have to consider it as a spectrum of diseases because it's not lung cancer, lung adenocarcinoma, it's not osteoarthritis. There is always spectrum of patients, spectrum of qualities, both on molecular level, but also on where is the patient coming from? What's the lifestyle? What's the environment where the patient is from? The data availability quality annotation is important. And that's why kind of going through publishing, that's great. But then we have to curate the information into databases and bringing all of the information through different kind of relationships, which are the networks that can be analyzed on its own. And importantly, through that, we get more than just a black box prediction. 
and we go closer to real intelligence and common sense as opposed to artificial intelligence because we can validate those those predictions experimentally we can see potentially where is the missing information based on that kind of prediction as i was showing on a previous slide with this uh, lower back uh, problem and so we can identify uh, sub cohorts through these biomarkers and identify the missing data to go back to annotation so it's really intertwining computational translational research and biological validation so to finish, I would like to highlight a uh, lot of collaborators across different fields that is uh, keep expanding and also uh, different funding agencies and collaborations that enabled this kind of research. And kind of highlighting that uh, I mentioned World Community Grid uh, that used to run for 17 years uh, as of uh, IBM. And as of September, it's actually running uh, from Cranville Research. So we are the new home for World Community Grid. We are in a process of uh, technical transfer. And so hopefully soon you will uh, see some more exciting projects uh, expanding into World Community Grid. And I would be happy to discuss more of them. And thanking, obviously, my lab that ensure that uh, the servers, databases, analysis, and data, and interpretation are uh, potentially meaningful. This is uh, Cranville Research. This is the Western Hospital uh, that is obviously very closely related. And if anybody uh, would like to have more information, uh, you can find more on our website, including the link to myself, and I would be happy to discuss more. Thank you, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Igor. Uh, thanks a lot for this fascinating talk full of various information. Uh, we have about five minutes or so um, uh, left, so I would like to maybe ask others uh, if they have any questions, uh, raise your hand or just start speaking because I have a whole half hour after this to ask you my questions. Anybody? Uh, hello, I have a question. Uh, hi, Igor. Uh, oh. uh, that, that was amazing. Thank you. Um, so, so one aspect that emerged from uh, from your presentation is that uh, in a, in, a, in a way there is a kind of a over reliance on the, the available uh, annotations that we use for uh, training our models, but also for testing uh, and validating uh, our conclusions. So uh, I was thinking is if like if the information that is uh, that is that is actually out there. Uh, can be used to, you know, create artificial intelligence models that are actually for the purpose of improving the annotations. So the, the, the case of the smoking status in lung cancer that you showed before, now that was missing, and so you were excluding the data because it was missing the smoking status. But maybe like this smoking status can be actually predicted using, uh, you know, other information that can inform or uh, use to infer this particular uh, label. And, and then use the, the, the associated data. You know what I mean? Uh, definitely. Um, so closest to this is, for example, protein interactions. And uh, while there are obviously more methods, both high throughput and low throughput, that are generating protein interactions on a yearly, uh, monthly basis, uh, there is still plenty where we can help with uh, different kind of machine learning. And uh, there are, first of all, different algorithms that one can use, but also there is a different information one can use. Uh, so there are approaches that take structural information into account and try to predict the interactions based on just the structural docking. There are others that take all sorts of other information together in terms of the conservation across species, sequence information, and so on. And so that's definitely one aspect where we can identify what is potentially missing. We can use the AI or data mining based approach to predict. We can use obviously existing data to validate, but it still leaves a relatively large chunk of data where we have a new prediction and we need new validation. And actually there are two aspects that we are interested in uh, specifically in this case, uh, because we also predict that some of the information that is in current curated databases is incorrect. And we did some preliminary validation where the only way to validate, obviously, is to read the existing paper, read all of the supplemental material, look through the experiments and say, is it really true or not? Because the database says these are interacting and we are predicting they are not. 
And so uh, in many cases, we have evidence of uh, about 50% correct prediction and incorrect curation. Now, this is going to be uh, obviously tricky to validate because that's covering about 40,000 interactions. So it's a lot of human effort that would need to be to go uh, through this. You mentioned uh, patients. Uh, definitely, one can, for example, take sequencing data and predict, is it a male or female? Great. Uh, can you validate it further? If you start predicting smoking status, the challenge is that you may be able to predict it, but you will not be able to validate it if the annotation is not there. So you may train it that, yes, this can predict the smoking status, but it's not going to be 100% correct for all of the patients. It's going to be, to a certain level, maybe 98% correct across certain cohorts. But the important part to me with precision medicine is not only what's the validation rate on a cohort level, but what's your confidence on an individual level? Right, so I may say I have a prediction algorithm for smoking status that is 98% uh, correct as we validated it. I have a patient X. I would like to know if the algorithm would be able to say with the 98% confidence, the patient is a smoker or it would be better if the algorithm would say, I don't know. This, for these patients, I rather not predict. But it is, it is definitely one of those things that uh, with, with good clinical collaboration, uh, I think that's the way to go where we combine the prediction, but not take it blindly, try to validate it and go back and forth. And eventually it will start going into the right direction and improve. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, uh, thanks, uh, David. Uh, does anybody have any more questions? We are a little bit past four, but let's maybe take one more question if there is. Anybody? No? Okay, then uh, I would like. Uh, ah. Uh, yes, <laughs> Igor just uh, <laughs> replied to the chat. Yeah, so the, the question for people who didn't see the chat was that uh, true that the Portugal seems to be even better these days. But uh, when I was looking in this uh, world in data uh, and specifically for how many unvaccinated would uh, not want to get vaccinated, uh, Portugal was not among the countries where the data was available, unfortunately. Uh, so I, I tried to include the data that obviously was available and was potentially relevant. But this, again, kind of highlights the aspect that one has to be careful how you interpret it, because missing data obviously doesn't mean that it's worse. It means that you just don't have ability to, to compare to something else. Thanks. <laughs> OK, any other questions for now? Not for now. OK, I would like to thank uh, Igor. This was great. This was fascinating, as usual. Um, and uh, I would like to close this uh, uh, session. And then uh, many of you have signed up and we'll have individual half hour meetings with Igor. OK, thank you all. And see you guys later. And Igor, we will rejoin on another Zoom, basically. Just yeah. OK, sounds good. Thanks. Bye.